Okay, today I'm going to go through Chapter 2 of the Friedland Relia book, concerns with chemistry, specifically the flow of matter and flow of energy through different systems. I'm talking about systems. I'm talking about systems. System could mean anything. It could be referring to an individual organism, like the codfish here. It could be referring to multiple species of organisms and how they interact with each other. It could be referring to those same organisms and the habitat they live in, or it could be referring to much larger systems, specifically ones that include humans and human activity. So we see that up at the top of the screen, a physiologist might see the cod or an individual organism as a system of organs in which matter and energy are both going to flow into and out of. And on a larger scale, someone who's interested in managing a fishery or is responsible for some form of fishery management would look at not just the individual organisms, but also the populations of fish and the human activity and how all of that is going to affect not just the living organisms, but the abiotic factors as well. So for us, matter mass, weight, we should know what this review means, we should know all know what these terms mean, um, and how they relate to our class is going to be seen pretty evidently when we go through everything, uh, that matter itself specifically, our biggest concern with matter in terms of chemistry is the flow of matter through different systems. Again, uh, should be simple review for atoms, elements, periodic table, and molecules. We know that atoms are the smallest, smallest part of matter, that different elements all have their own different atoms, and that those atoms can combine to form larger compounds. And those larger compounds can be made up of the same element. They could be made up of more than one element. This page does have some interesting stuff here for us in terms of the fact that we need to look at atomic number, mass number, and isotopes when we get to nuclear energy as a renewable form of energy. So we will do some stuff with that information, but just reviewing that atomic number, mass number, and isotopes, what it means for each one of those, what each one of those terms means in terms of matter. Radioactive decay is definitely something that we should be familiar with when we start talking about nuclear energy. The idea is that radioactive, de behind radioactive decay is that radioactive elements will start to break down and they will start to decay into other elements. For example, uranium-235 will decay into thorium with a different atomic number and have a mass number of 231 here. In this situation, we would call uranium the parent because it is decaying into thorium, which we would call our daughter. Now, half-life becomes an important piece of information when we look at how long does it take original radioactive parent atoms to decay. Things that take a very long time to decay will obviously stay in their, in their respective organism or area or system for a much longer period of time. Uh, definitely important when studying poisonous things and how they relate to individual organisms, things that will accumulate. Important when studying fossils and important when looking in terms of carbon dating. Uh, and definitely does have some relevance when we talk about one of the downsides to nuclear power is the half-life of the uranium that is being used to generate said energy. So for chemical bonds, we know that we have covalent bonds where we have atoms being shared. And ionic bonds are different in that we have that transfer of electrons to get our positive and negatively charged atoms. Both ionic and covalent bonds are very important parts of environmental science because they are scattered throughout when we're looking at different systems, you know, whether we're talking about living or non-living organisms or areas or sectors. Uh, we do deal with not just one or the other, but definitely a mix of the two different compounds. Water, as always, is still very important. Okay, and again, water is very important in environmental science because of its relative nature for living things because of how much we rely on it as living organisms, uh, the, its ability to support life and perform a myriad of other functions makes water very, very important. Uh, one such one that we look at in environmental science is the fact that water is polar means that it is going to be good at dissolving other polar molecules. So when water is polar and interacts with other polar molecules, we see that 
water itself can dissolve a lot of things. It does pose some problems when certain compounds that are polar that do get into the environment when we're talking about pollutants or other types of things that are introduced into a specific ecosystem can very easily dissolve into the water supply of that ecosystem and depending on the living organisms that are there the communities there could have far-reaching effects that could be pretty damaging depending on the nature of the pollutant the strength the toxicity so all those things can pose problems if they are able to get into certain water systems because of water's nature as a polar solvent acids and bases is actually a very important part of the chemistry we'll talk about specifically when we start looking at uh, ocean acidification we're going to see that the acid-base reactions or the fact that compounds breaking down into acidic and basic substances, acidic or basic substances, um, does tend to become an issue when we look at our current ocean situation. Because if you look at the chart here, and, I can, and you can pause and go back if you didn't finish copying the acids and base definition, but notice that seawater is listed at just over an 8 on the pH scale, making it slightly basic. The problem we have in ocean acidification, which is something that we currently see happening right now in the world's oceans, is that the seawater is starting to drop in pH. And by dropping, we mean it's becoming more acidic. So when we look at ocean acidification, we are going to focus on the chemistry of how the compounds, which carbon dioxide in this case, are causing an increase in the acidity of seawater just by their presence in the water. Now, reviewing chemical reactions, we know that reactions are responsible for giving us a whole number of molecules that are important. This is the bigger one here, conservation of matter. The fact that matter can't be created or destroyed, specifically when we're talking about resources and resource management, because we know that once we use something up, it's not like we can just magically make more of it. Once some matter has been converted, it can be converted into different forms, but it can't always be made out of thin air, or I'm sorry, it can't be made out of thin air. And in all, oftentimes it's very difficult to get it back to our original form. The process of recycling, which does take matter and tries to uh, conserve more of it, becomes very difficult because even though some of that material is being recycled, not all of it is 100% recycled. And we'll see more of that when we talk about energy specifically. Inorganic compounds and organic compounds, knowing that organic compounds are going to have our carbon-carbon bonds, um, very common, and obviously our living material and inorganic compounds have to deal with a lot of the external or abiotic factors, a lot of compounds important in the abiotic world. And a quick here, a little review of biological molecules and what they are. Now, energy becomes the, uh, an important piece in environmental science because Energy itself, being the ability to do work, is measured and calculated in a number of different ways. From the biological standpoint, it's measured in calories in terms of how much energy are specific organisms using, or in terms of food consumption. When we're look, talking about energy on a grand scale, in terms of population use of energy, we're measuring it in terms of either either British thermal units or what's called the kilowatt hour which are both measures of energy transfer in different appliances, kilowatt hour being our main unit, especially measuring in terms of electricity. So in studying efficiency, we're gonna look at the kilowatt hour in terms of is this source of energy efficient at producing energy in terms of the amount of electricity that's there. So we have our different forms of energy, kinetic and potential energy being the two different categories there, kinetic being energy that's mo that's moving or in motion, and potential being the energy that is stored, you know, the potential energy that could be released there. Chemical energy is a type of potential energy stored in chemical bonds. We know that living organisms use the chemical energy found in sugars to do work, and when we're creating energy on a large scale, we're more often taking advantage of the chemical energy stored in fossil fuels. So we see here with this waterfall, a good demonstration of both potential and kinetic energy. The potential energy that the water has is based on its position and its height here in the dam. And as it flows down into the basin here at the bottom, we have a, uh, we see the kinetic energy caused by the movement of that water 
which if this was a hydroelectric dam, which it appears to be, would be cause for the fact that that moving water is going to help generate electricity. And we see some of that energy being given off in terms of what would be light and sound as it is changing uh, forms and crashing down here at the bottom. But here we see all this potential energy as it passes through any turbines over here is going to be used to create some electricity. Now in studying energy and environmental science, the laws of thermodynamics become very important. We know that the first law says energy cannot be created or destroyed. We cannot get something from nothing. Car is a good way to look at it that even though it doesn't feel like it, all of the energy that goes into a car is being put out of it. What we tend to forget is that some of it is useful and a majority of the time energy is lost or wasted in the forms of heat or with a car sound and light even though we wouldn't see the light. More waste energy comes from that even though we are getting the useful energy we desire. Majority of it does tend to be lost as term in terms of waste. So when studying efficiency, we want to look at how efficient is the energy transfer from the start or the origin, the source of it, to the us, the consumer, or the individual that's using that energy. For a sample calculation here, we see that a power plant might only retain 35% of the energy, chemical energy, from burning, let's say, coal, and turn that into electricity. As that electricity travels down power lines, about 90% of it manages to make it into a consumer's home, while on average maybe 10% would be lost to, things, to heat. And then if all that electricity is being transferred into a light bulb, light bulbs for the most part used to be pretty inefficient items. That's why we've gone away from these incandescent light bulbs and moved uh, towards the uh, more energy efficient versions. Because you can see here only about 5% of that energy is actually converted to light. About 95% gets converted to heat, which if you ever felt an old incandescent light bulb, they can get pretty hot if they've been on for a while. So a quick calculation shows that the chemical energy from this power plant getting transferred into light energy in a light bulb only produces about 1.6% efficiency, and that's a pretty low number. So when we study energy, study energy use and consumption, we want to look at ways that how can we get this number to be much higher than it is? What are some of the methods that will help us do that? So our second law of thermodynamics talking about how much energy is being converted into useful energy versus how much energy is being lost as heat and not able to do any kind of work. That's what we really want to focus on. And that's really would be, a, you know, that's a, one of the main areas of today's environmental science study, or at least uh, is trying to find more energy efficient ways to do things, trying to find ways to manage the amount of energy that's being created, the amount of potential energy, and really turn it into usable, workable kinetic energy. We see here uh, one example being the use of a traditional fireplace versus what's a, uh, seen here as a modern wood stove. Notice that it's smaller, it's more compact, it's more energy efficient. And because it's more energy efficient, it's able to use less wood to generate the same amount of energy. A lot less, or in terms, to, to, I should say, the, to generate more workable energy. More energy is going to be saved here and conserved, and less is going to be lost as heat than with our traditional energy. Uh, use than with our traditional fireplaces. We see this in a lot of appliances, uh, General Electric especially having many, many appliances that are labeled as energy smart or energy efficient. Uh, washers and dryers, washing machines, lar refrigerators, large appliances that use a large amount of energy, televisions, things like that. The move towards more energy efficient items is one small way that we are working to conserve energy and use fewer resources. Oops, sorry about that. Now, when studying energy and matter, it's important to recognize that one of them is open and one of them is closed. Matter is closed because, for the most part, we have no major inputs or outputs outside of small amounts of matter that have made its way onto our Earths in our current time period and no major outputs in terms of the amount of things that leave. Matter that we have is pretty much this is it. We have nothing really coming in, bringing in large sources or chunks of matter. Energy, however, is the exact opposite. Energy in, is an open system because the main source of almost all energy sources, we can 
go back to would be solar radiation for the most part. Solar radiation comes in and our outputs are heat, energy, reflected light. So there's a constant one-way system here where energy is going in and energy is leaving. In terms of matter, it's a very closed system where we don't see anything going in or out. Now, in terms of having an open and enclosed system, different ecosystems will require, and different systems will require steady state, or they'll try to stay in a steady state where the amount of inputs is going to equal the amount of outputs in order to keep a steady state. So we see here our bucket is a good example of this. Within the bucket is 10 liters of water. If the input is one liter per second and the output is one liter per second, the level of water in that bucket will never change. If we were to change the input, where the input was greater than the output, the bucket would start to rise and overflow. If the output was greater than the input, the bucket would start to stink, sink. Neither of those situations would be considered steady state. What is steady state here is what we see in this diagram. Now, talking about energy, it's very difficult for our Earth to stay in a steady state in terms of heat because the amount of solar radiation coming in should equal the amount of solar radiation going out in order to maintain a steady state. But as we continue to create greenhouse gases and emit them into our atmosphere, the input is staying the same and the output is decreasing, which is one of the things that's leading towards an increase in temperatures globally. And ways that our Earth, or just systems in general, will manage steady state is with feedback loops. So a negative feedback loop being when a system responds by trying to return to its original state, we're decreasing the rate that the change is occurring, doing something to try and get back to normal. That's what we call a negative feedback loop. Something isn't right and the system responds to get back to normal, to get back to its baseline, to reach that, you remember from biology, what we'd call homeostasis. Positive feedback loops work the opposite way, which is basically when a system responds to an increase in change by increasing the rate that the change is occurring. Positive feedback loops usually happen, what will, what will term in a lot of environmental situations as vicious cycles. And looking here at this last example, uh, a negative feedback loop might be a lake that starts to experience evaporation. So as the water evaporates, the lake level drops. Since the level is dropping, we have less surface area, meaning less surface area would lead to less evaporation. So less water would be lost and the lake's water level would continue to rise until reaching that steady state again. That's a negative feedback loop example. A positive feedback loop is an example of population. So as people are born, the population increases. If the population increases, we can expect more births, which means the population is going to increase. And this cycle will continue until something stops it because this cycle is built where one change leads to an increase in the other change. This cycle here, one change will lead to a decrease in the original change. And that's our review of chemistry in terms of matter and energy. Most of this stuff, uh, as we go through specific topics, we will look back on and focus more on. But very important things to, to keep in mind are the idea of looking at matter and energy as it moves through a system, not just focusing on any one individual thing, any one individual uh, movement, but actually really focusing, focusing on how that matter or that energy is moving through the system and what kinds of effects it will have or could potentially have. So that's our second chapter. Looking forward to seeing you next time on our next chapter, which will be level, uh, chapter 20, focusing on sustainability and economics in environmental science.